Creating a culture of stewardship is about so much more than just taking up better offerings. As we look into this concept, we're going to dig deep into the ideas behind culture and the ideas behind stewardship and see how we can use these collectively to help all of our churches create cultures where people are willing to give of their time, their talent, and their treasures. Culture can be defined as whatever the accepted norms are. Take any, any business, any corporation, any church, any family, uh, and then you can go beyond that with ethnic groups and cities and states and cultures. You, you look into all those and you see what are their collective beliefs, what are their collective behaviors, and what are their collective values. To really dig into this, we have to understand that culture is not created by just a few people. Culture is created when the vast majority of a group is acting the same way, going along in the same manners, thinking the same ways. Every church has its own culture. You could take the same doctrine, put it in different churches, and how the culture of that church is can determine how that doctrine is taught, how that doctrine is, is preached, how it's related back to the community. It's all driven by culture. We want to develop cultures of stewardship. And to do that, we have to make sure we're using this word correctively. Whenever we look at uh, money, take for instance, money doesn't save itself. And just like money doesn't save itself, culture cannot change itself. People can establish culture, and over time, you want to look at, you know, we may need to change the culture of something. We want to change how we do something. It takes time, and it takes a process. Looking back at the origin of this word, we understand that it was actually created in the 1400s with farmers, how they tilled their fields, how they prepared and cultivated their fields, how they would take care of their fields. They would refer to that as culturing a field. And that applies so wonderful when we talk about uh, preparing for a harvest in the kingdom of God. What a, what a great analogy here to work with. Culture determines outcome. Whatever gets cultivated is what gets harvested. We understand that from Scripture. The principle is very clear. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The same principle applies in how we develop the cultures of our church. What a pastor intentionally and strategically cultivates in the church. How you sow into the belief system of people, how you teach them about these concepts is what eventually comes out with their actions. So you start with beliefs and you, you develop those beliefs and the values and those turn into the behaviors that the church has. As we look at this and we understand that, uh, you have to ask yourself those hard questions. What is the culture of giving in our church? What is the culture behind how people give? How do people think about giving? How do they think about uh, helping people? And how do they think about volunteering? Is it a burden to them? Or is it taught in such a way where people can embrace it and realize that whether they have a lot of money or if they have a little money, they can still be great stewards as it relates to giving in the church? How would you describe the mutual approach to giving in your church. If you're, you know, in this uh, session here, you're probably here to try to learn how can I make it better? You know, there's room for improvement in this. And so I'm going to challenge all of the pastors that are watching this to think very strategically about how you implement giving in the church. It has to be so much more than just taking up an offering on Sunday. It has to go way beyond just even going to the pulpit and saying, hey, we have a special need. Let's try to give to this. You, you set all that up by how you teach the principles along the way. Whenever we talk about giving, we have to understand that stewardship is more than just money. When we talk about this, we think about how that the word steward itself, you know, in the Bible means to be entrusted with the care of something that belongs to someone else. You know, our time, our talents, our treasures, everything we have, we believe this all belongs to God. That is a value that has to be uh, really grasped within a congregation before it can be acted on. If people don't believe that everything belongs to God, then it's hard to teach them about being a steward of what God has given you. But when we understand, you know, we, we re refer to the verse, you know, that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And we talk about that. Some people say, well, yeah, he can own all those cattle, but he doesn't have mine. And that's how we treat our money a lot of time. That's how we treat our time. That's how we treat our talents. If we don't have the proper perspective of stewardship, 
throughout our whole life. Let's talk about time. We're all given the same amount of time. Everybody has 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We understand that. But you look at how people manage their time and realize how important personal discipline is with our time. When we start talking about personal discipline, you know, that's the ability to tell yourself, no, you have to stay on task with something. You have to get a project done. You have to manage out your time. That Those elements that you use to manage your time really is the same principles that you use for managing your talents and managing your treasures. If people have no control over their time, then I'm going to question if they have control over anything in their life. If they can't control their calendar, they probably can't control their checkbook. So as we look at this, we want to encourage people and teach people how to be good stewards of their time. That directly relates to volunteering in the church. You know, when we look at churches, obviously we need volunteers. No church can operate with just one person. It takes a team of people. Whether it's a small church or a large church, you depend on volunteers. We're going to talk a little bit more later about how to teach about volunteering in the church. The second one are our talents, time and talents. Jesus taught the principle very plainly that everyone receives at least one talent. We see that he, he showed the examples of some get five talents, some get three talents, some just get one talent. What he looks for is what are we doing with those talents? How are we stewarding them? How are we managing what God has given us? If God has given you uh, technical abilities, you know, he expects you to manage those and use those for the benefit of the kingdom. You know, we always want to categorize talents in, in terms of, you know, how someone sings or how they play an instrument or maybe even how someone preaches their delivery styles. But we need to look way beyond that and realize that God has blessed people in our church with various talents. There are people that have incredible uh, gifts of help and, and how they can just come alongside and, and be such a, an integral part of making a church uh, be successful. How are you teaching that, the management of talent within your church and giving people opportunities to use those talents for the kingdom's sake and helping them realize there are many ways that people can be, uh, uh, be active in a church way beyond just what happens on the platform. You know, the third area that we talk about, of course, is treasure. That's the most common thing that people think about when you consider stewardship. It, we always want to talk about our money. So let's look at it a little bit beyond that, more than just cash. What do we treasure? And obviously we're putting this in the context of material things. Okay, that can be real estate. It can be vehicles. It can be any type of, of cash investment. Um, anything that you value that has value. How are you managing those things? One of the things that Brother Jury, the director of stewardship, says a lot is he asks people, you know, why did God give you everything he gave you? Why do you think he did that? Did God give you all of this just so you can say, hey, look what I have. No, God gives us whatever he's given us so that we can be a blessing to others. It's not just about keeping it all to ourselves and building bigger barns to store all of our stuff in. It's about being a blessing through the act of stewardship. All of these things matter to God. Again, God owns everything and God entrusts us with all of his goods. And when he does that, he looks upon us and he puts a responsibility on us to make sure we are taking the best care of it that we can. As we look at creating a culture of stewardship, it's also about cultivating expectations. What are you expecting of the people? What do you, how do you expect people to volunteer? Um, do you just sit around and hope they're just going to show up on a Saturday for a work day? Or do you proactively two weeks in advance announce, you know, hey, we're going to have a work day on Saturday and you get a sign up sheet where people have to, you know, they got to sign up for some specific job. Never underestimate the power of setting that up weeks in advance so that people can commit ahead of time. Because if you just announce, hey, we're going to have a work day on Saturday and you just show up and you expect everybody to show up, they're probably not going to meet your expectations. But when you take a more systematic approach to it, then people are more likely to show up and give of their time. When we talk about teaching it, we have to make sure that we're not beating people over the head when it comes to money. We're not guilt tripping them. There is nothing in the Bible that supports guilting people into giving. We never want to go there with those conversations. But we want to teach people the blessings of giving out of a cheerful heart. You know, we, we know the scriptures. God loves a cheerful 
giver, someone who gives with joy, someone who understands that it really is more blessed to give than to receive. They understand that the, the scripture in the New Testament that says that, you know, that when we receive the offerings and we give them to people, how much those people will start to thank God. It's not about thanking necessarily the, the giver itself, but it's about thanking the one that supplies everything that we have. These are things that people should learn how to do. They want to learn how to give because people are more willing to give from a cheerful heart than they ever will with a forced hand. When you try to force people's hand to give to something, you know, you, you put it on them as if we have to have this this Sunday and it's a it's an adamant thing. People tend to get defensive about that. And the, one of the things that they're going to protect is their checkbook. But whenever you teach this aspect of getting on board and understand that people can do this cheerfully, they will give more. The next thing you want to make sure you're doing in cultivating expectations is demonstrating it yourself. Uh, how, let people see how you give. Now, I'm not saying you go to the pulpit and you say, hey, I gave $500 to the youth department this week. That's not what it's about. But people watch and people can tell. You know, uh, I had someone tell me when I was pastoring one time that they noticed that when the offering bucket was passed, that I would put something in the bucket. They didn't know how much it was. That didn't matter. But the fact that they saw the pastor giving, you know, I go to some churches and, and the pastors, they, they never give into the offering buckets and they may have other ways of giving. But just think about the message that it sends and that how when people see the pastor giving in the offering bucket, that means you're practicing what you preach and you're showing them that you are doing what you're trying to teach them to do. Also, of giving of your time, all those kind of how you give your talents. Obviously, pastors and pastoral families, we give a lot. A lot of the ministry families do that. And we understand that concept. But make sure you're doing it in a way that is also encouraging other people to follow you, follow you as you lead them. Finally, prioritizing it. How do we prioritize stewardship in the church? How do you prioritize the concepts of time, talent, and treasures all belong to God and we want to give back as He's given to us. We prioritize it through how we teach it and how we model it. In all of this, stewardship is a factor of discipleship. Again, I go back to if someone's, uh, you know, if their calendar is, is, you know, in disarray and they have no control over their calendar, they have no control over their time, they probably don't have control over their checkbook. And when you see that, there's a good chance that they probably don't have control over their spiritual life as well. The more discipline that you can put into time, talent, and treasures, you'll see that spill over into their spiritual disciplines. If they can't say no to the temptation to buy something that they shouldn't buy, then they're probably going to have a tough time saying no to spiritual temptations, to sinful temptations. All of this is, is worked together because it's about the full person that we are. I want to make sure that we are also working to overcome the fear of talking about money. I've had several pastors ask me, you know, for, for advice on how to teach money because they're scared of it. And one of the things that they're afraid of is how it might appear to be uh, self-serving. You know, if, if a pastor gets up and he's talking about giving of tithes, obviously those tithes go to support his salary, his payroll. And so in doing so, it feels self-serving. Um, that's why we always encourage people to make sure you're using biblical principles and showing people the scriptures behind it, not using your own personal uh, experiences, you know, for self gain and things like that. You know, recognizing that stewardship is a biblical principle. This is something Jesus talked about money. You know, this is something that you look through and you see it all through the Bible. God blesses you know the cheerful giver. We've used that one. You know, there's a lot of times where we we want to talk about it but we're afraid to talk about it. But recognizing this is biblical. We have a mandate from God to teach people how to be blessed. And that's the key right there. It's not about getting them to give so that you can get paid more. This is about teaching people how to be blessed because their tithes and their offerings go to bless thousands, if you know, definitely hundreds, if not thousands of people. Um, when we acknowledge that it is also a disciple-making concept, then as you teach the elements of stewardship, and you're teaching them how to be a better disciple, you are helping their whole person. You're helping their whole life. You're helping their marriage. You're helping their home life. You're helping them on their job. You're helping them in all the ways that affect their lives when you take time to overcome fears and actually teach about the concepts of stewardship. 
You're not just teaching them why to give. You're teaching them how to be a better disciple. I'm going to wrap it up with a few teaching tips we've picked up along the way. Make sure you take time to showcase how their past giving has blessed others. If you have a video of a missionary that's talking about how that those, those monthly PIMs are supporting them on the mission field, show those videos. If you have uh, other materials or pictures, you can get off of social media and show pictures of how you know children at, at Tupelo Children's Mansion are being blessed or youth events that are, that are blessing young people or even in your local church where there's testimonies where people can stand up and say, hey, you know, we, we committed to, to a financial sacrificial offering. And three weeks later, you know, my husband got a raise on the job, things like that. Making sure you're showcasing how the giving is blessing those that are receiving it. And then how God is returning that blessing back to your local assembly there. We would also encourage you to take an entire month and dedicate it to stewardship. Have a theme for that month that in, in one particular month, Maybe the first Sunday, you're going to focus on the stewardship of time. Or maybe on a, you do a Wednesday night series where the first Wednesday night, talking about time. The second one, it's talking about talents. The third one is talking about our treasures. And you cover all of these aspects throughout the month. And then you may have a testimony day where people talk about how the blessings of God have flown back into their lives or how they were blessed by the giving of others. Another thing that we would suggest is hosting a life planning seminar. Now, this can be done by the United Pentecostal Church Foundation and the team there, or you can even have someone from your own community come in and talk about setting up wills and estates and the concepts of, of uh, life insurance planning that roll back into and how to, how to leave a bequest to the church. All those different ways. When you're educating your people, you are cultivating that culture of stewardship. Finally, think about how you empower people to give what matters most, how you motivate them, how they are inspired and taught. Inspiration can last just for a moment, but when you truly teach the principles where it becomes part of their beliefs and part of their values, you don't have to rely on inspiration. You don't have to lie, rely on you know, some kind of a story that uh, you know, just really kind of gets someone in the heart. You can rely on what, you're been, what you've been teaching and what's, what's been believing and the things that have been valued in your congregation. We know God's blessings flow through his principles. And I'll leave you with this verse, Proverbs eleven twenty five: A generous person will prosper. One who refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. God will never be a borrower from anybody. God's never going to owe anybody anything. So as you bless others and as you teach people how to bless others, you can trust his word that God is going to bless you in return.